Breakthrough. And tonight I'm bringing you a very special interview. You know, there's a saying that says, ask and ye shall receive. Well, I had asked myself, what would it be like to interview Albert Einstein? And sure enough, I got my answer. So tonight I want to bring to you a very special interview. Albert, are you with us? Are we on? Yes, we are, are we on, live. Austin? We are live. Oh, hello, Austin. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Well, it is an honor to welcome one of the most iconic and influential figures, not only in the 20th century, but in history. Allow me to welcome the great Mr. Albert Einstein. That was very kind of you to say. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you, Austin. And thank you for the power of technology and time travel. I figured it out. <laughs> well, but we're going to have some media. It's quite an honor to be featured on your show, Flashpoint. And I love the burst of light in your logo. You know, Albert loves light. I love to study light. And light brought me here. I want you to know, though, Austin, that I had some aha moments myself and flashpoint moments, as you described them, just today when I was sailing out in my boat. So I came back here to the laboratory, and I'm, I'm working on a few of those formulas right now. So if you don't mind, I am a multitasker and a time management person. So if you don't mind, I'd like to, while I have these ideas in my head, I would like to work on them here and carry on this uh, interview, if it's all right with you. That would be perfect with me. We'll, we'll catch you in mid midstream. So please continue with your work. We're going to get into some conversation. We're glad you're here. And when you talk about your story, it's so rich and it would be impossible to cover everything here. But what I want to focus on for the purpose of Flashpoint is the inspirational side of your journey as, a, uh, you know, the inspirational side of your journey and you as a man, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a rich history there. Um, so I definitely want to cover that if you're okay with that. Sure. And I want to start with the early years because it, it has been rumored that you could not speak until you were three years of age. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, I is know. Is it true? Well, I, I know this story has taken on a life of its own throughout uh, history. Well, there, there is some truth to the story. It's not completely true. So what I want to let you know is there's a vast difference between an inability, an inability to speak and a reluctance to speak. In my case, it was a reluctance to speak. I was a lone child. I did not spend much time with other playmates. I spent most of my time in my room doing things like working puzzles and building houses of cards. Sometimes I built them as high as 14 stories high just for the delight of tearing them down and building them again with a different design. Rather odd, I suppose, but I suppose I'm a rather odd person. But I could speak. I was just reluctant to. We had a housemaid that told me later on in my life, a little later on, maybe 10 or 12 years old, that I used to repeat my responses. She said, Albert, are you ready to come down for supper? And I said, yes, I'm hungry. I'm ready to come down. Yes, I'm hungry. I'm ready to come down. Now, I don't know how odd that is to most people. But she seemed to think it was quite odd. But I am a little bit odd. <laughs> well, it's interesting that it sounds like you. it's not that you couldn't speak. You, you were reluctant to speak. And you were often solving puzzles at an early age, it sounds like. Yes, yes, that's very true. You know, it's amazing. Um, do, you, do you recall to this point, do you recall the genesis of your journey? I mean, when did you get this intense curiosity to really understand the way everything works and, and, and how the universe works? Well, I suppose 
that started when I was five years old. I became ill and bedridden. And my father, Herman, brought me a little toy, and I carry it with me to this day. It is this very compass right here, made wow. in Germany. And I would spend hours on end lying in my sick bed, sitting up in my sick bed, and turning this compass backwards and forwards, all the time realizing that the needle kept pointing in the same direction, no matter how I turned it. It was just fascinating. And so it sounds like you you recognized an energy or, or a force mm -hmm. early on, and you wanted to understand it at a deep level. Is that right? Yes, that's very true, precisely. I wanted to understand the rules by which God created this glorious universe. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's impressive, and I know <laughs> we won't get too far into that conversation for here, but I know there's a whole lot of conversation around, around that. But that's a bold, impressive way to think. And I, I guess I want to say that it fueled your passion to understand even more. Exactly. Uh, despite my criticism I received in, later in my journey, I wanted to understand more. That's amazing. Not, not many people ever give themselves permission to think or pursue anything that deeply. Mm -hmm. You know, more on that later. For now, let, let's go deeper into your journey. As you move forward, I, I understand later that your applications to these major universities, you, you've spent all this time educating yourself, and you, you submit these applications to these universities in Europe, and, and they were rejected. Is that true? You did not get accepted to any of these schools? Yes, this is very true. I was struggling very much in questioning my own pursuits. Fortunately, my father, Herman, had pulled some strings to get me a job as a third-class clerk in a patent office. This proved to be my saving grace at the time. I was unable to squeeze out a li I was able to squeeze out a living for my new family and also had time to pursue my study. Although challenging, it turned out to be just perfect. Yes, and I, I, I've heard that story, and I believe you you barely got the job. You were like a, um, I can't remember, it was a third class patent clerk or, or, or whatever, it, whatever it was. Yeah. And I also heard that, is it true <laughs> that you were reprimanded during work because they, they accused you of daydreaming? <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. I was daydreaming and creating scenarios in my head. Questions, if you will, that would give me a greater understanding of the formulas I was working on. Questions? What? Precisely. What, well, you were daydreaming. You were you were asking yourself questions. Yes, yes. If you want to get to the right answers, you must first start with the right question. These questions allow me to go deeper and utilize the other side of my brain. As I stated many times before, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. These questions would allow me to access the entire world. I would access the outcome through imagination, then go back to my logical brain to prove or disprove what I had hypothesized to be proved. Always remember, viewers and listeners, logic will get you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. Ah, oh, I got I got chills because I remembered a story. I had a flashpoint moment that I was I was sitting out to eat with my brother, and we were talking about this concept, and I was talking about this very concept. And unbeknownst to me, we were sitting outside and I looked down and your quote was in, emblazoned into the concrete. And it said what you just said, that imagination is more important than knowledge. That is, that is brilliant. Um, so this is really impressive. And I know our listeners can benefit from this process. 
Mm-hmm. Use your imagination and ask yourself the right questions. It seems you develop this uh, process at a high level to leading into your miracle year. Yes, absolutely. If I had not developed my imagination and intuition to a high capacity, I would never have discovered E equals MC squared, nor would I have established that light is made up of particles, which won me the Nobel Peace Prize in physics for my work on the photoelectric effect. That, that is so true. And, and most people don't realize that, that uh, you actually won the Nobel Prize based on your work with light, not E equals MC squared at that time. So I think that's really interesting. So this is a great lead into your miracle year. Did you fully realize what you uncovered during that year? Well, I knew my work was finally coming to fruition. My approach was not to understand everything at that time. I knew, however, I could create a different, deeper understanding of portions of the universe. Light, for example. Having said this, I still had doubts from time to time. My work was dubiously received in 1905, so I did not feel like a miracle year was happening at all at the time. So, so even Albert Einstein has doubts, is what you're saying? Oh, yes. I, I suppose it was God's way of keeping me humble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and... Uh, did, did you have any, any, any flash, flashes of inspiration um, that led to, to your breakthroughs? Uh, did you, do you remember? Absolutely. I had multiple flashpoint moments. <laughs> one in particular, one very notable. It had to do with a train, two observers, and two simultaneous bolts of lightning. I concluded if one observer is on the platform and one is on a train, witnessing two bolts of lightning in the front and back of the train, they would observe them differently. This moving train created relatively a, a relatively different experience. The observer on the train would experience the bolts one after the other, while the observer on the platform would observe them simultaneously. I knew then that I had the workings or the theory of relativity. Wow, that, that's, that is incredible. And, and not to confuse our listeners, because I, I know this, this uh, work and the bolts of lightning are actually simultaneously to the observer, but unless you're traveling. We will post a video on that as not to confuse everybody here, but uh, that's an incredible insight. Um, and and it, it's amazing that it points back to creating, uh, imagine, using your imagination to to create these scenarios. Absolutely. So that, uh, yeah, so, so that you could you could develop these things. So, um, yeah, anything more on that, on, on imagination? Well, I encourage your listeners to use the creative imagination in their own lives. Again, if I had been merely bound to the science laws of the time, void of my imagination, I would never have discovered these principles of the universe. The secret is to create. That is so true because when you think of a genius and you think of yourself, that you, you think of this incredible logical brain, but in everything that you talk about is all about imagination. And if you study the other people of your time, they were incredibly great mathematicians, astronomers, but I feel like they did not have the capacity that you had in this imagine um, with the imagination. So this is wonderful. So let's talk about your life after the miracle year. You had submitted these papers in 1905, and you write these amazing papers. You submit them. You get some response, but very little. It's, it, it's not as much as you would think. And you're still working at the patent office after creating these incredible formulas. But it seems while you made progress with your academic career, you stayed at the patent office for four years. Uh, yes, I, I continue to develop my work, in, including my general theory of relativity. I did receive an honorary doctorate 
from the University of Zurich in 1906. But it wasn't until October of 1909 that I left the patent office to become an associate professor at the University of Zurich. Max Planck, recognizing me and my work, was the major catalyst for my progress. My work had little to no recognition before then. Yes, and this, this is part of a flashpoint is I call it people proximity. And it's relative to the, the people that come into your life. And this is a really great point that had it not been for Max Planck, who was a very well-respected uh, individual at that time that recognized your work, it, your, your path would have took a completely different, different, uh, different road. And who knows where you would have ended up. So, yeah, who's to say? But I know that it's possible for sure that that would have been the case. I owe a great deal to Max. I truly do not know what would have happened without him. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the single most important component of Flashpoint. And, you know, who you're around impacts everything. I like that. But I completely concur. Maybe we can create a formula sometime. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm working on that now. Maybe you can check my calculations. Absolutely. The same way my first wife, Milva Merich, who is a great physicist in her own right, used to check my calculations to make sure everything I did was correct. Yes, I, I've heard that story. So I'm working on that, and um, we'll keep we'll, we'll table that for now, but. I want to ask you, what was the one of the biggest challenges you, you faced during your journey? Well, one of my biggest challenges proved to be my biggest opportunity. I mentioned earlier, I was not accepted to work at any of the major universities to continue my study. I was forced to study on my own. This motivated me even more and allowed me to stay outside the box of the time. Since I was challenging the laws that had been accepted for hundreds of years, this proved to be best in hindsight for me. Very insightful indeed. That, that makes a lot of sense. Had you been in that world, you might have been indoctrinated to think a different way. You may not have had the freedom to pursue the work that you did on your own. So amazing. Um, why did you agree to speak? This is a question. So why did you agree to speak at the Prussian Academy of Sciences on your theory of general relativity when you knew your math was flawed? <laughs> How do you know so much about me, Austin? <laughs> I did a lot of studying. Let's just say that. Well, I knew I could come up with a solution eventually. As it is with the universe, things are always moving. And I knew I must move forward too, even if I did not have it perfected yet. Life is like riding a bicycle. In order to keep balance, you have to keep moving. Well, history would write that. That is exactly what happened. Despite the pressure of the opposition, you did in fact perfect the formula. And from what I've read, just in time, by studying the heavenly bodies based on an old formula you had thought not useful. This is true. No work is ever lost. I have had major flashes of insight by realizing my mistakes or by realizing something I thought an earlier mistake is now useful. And this was the case here. Brilliant. But... That would make perfect sense in this conversation. So th this has been an amazing time. I would love to have you back on here again at some point in the future. Oh, I'd um, love to do that. Yes, I'd love to return and talk to your viewers. Maybe even face-to-face. -face. Uh, that would be even incredible for the listeners. But is there anything else that we can discuss in our final minutes together? Well, you know, there are many quotes that have been attributed to me that actually were not my quotes. You know, every every uh, quote that seems to have a, a good uh, 
knowledgeable context to it, people like to attribute it to me. Things like uh, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. That was actually William Bruce Cameron's 1963 work, Informal Sociology, a casual introduction to sociological thinking. Not mine, but a good quote, nonetheless. Or something like, and, and maybe your viewers have been watching this on what you call the application Facebook. Uh, they, may, they may have seen a split screen with me on one side, a picture of me on one side, on a picture of six or seven young ladies standing in a tight circle, looking down at their phones, texting each other rather than speaking to each other? Ah, uh, the quote was, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Not my quote, but as I have been noticing people around since I came back, Everyone is staring down. I saw a young man the other day walking down the street and he ran headlong into a light pole. <laughs> Unbelievable. No connection with me, just a few internet memes, do you call them? Yes, memes. Another one I like to talk about is if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. Now, that one can actually be traced back to a 1958 product engineering article that said, there is an age-old adage, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the theory. But too often, it's easier to keep the theory than change the facts. And people just rearrange that, put my face on it, and attributed it to me. Yes, well, let's talk about some of the quotes because my dog concurs. <laughs> let's talk about some of the quotes that you are maybe notable for. And, and I also want to talk about the, these trying times that we're in right now. I know you're, you're, you know the recent news. I would love to just maybe close with a, a, a quote and then maybe something you'd want to share to people that of this day and age and especially what's happening right now. Well, during this time of the coronavirus scare, let's see, COVID-19, if you will, it is my sincere hope that the time in which we are finding ourselves cooped up in our own homes, practicing quarantining ourselves and social distancing, it is my prayer that people will realize the importance of human interaction, the importance of touch, the importance of speaking to each other directly, even if it's just to call someone on the phone and ask how they are, instead of texting all the time. It is so impersonal. And so many uh, relationships have been broken up because people misunderstand the text that someone is sending them. You know, maybe maybe spell check, I think that's what it's called, might accidentally capitalize something that you meant to not be capitalized on the people that read it think, oh, he must be mad at me. Well, I'll unfriend him right now. You see how easy it can happen by using this tech this impersonal technology? We need to interact with each other. My quotes that I would like to talk to you about are things like staying away from negative people. They have a problem for every solution. You know, we cannot solve problems with the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. A person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new. Remember, you never stop failing. 
until you stop trying. And delight in other people's success. Don't be competitive, but be cooperative. Love one another. Bask in the happiness you will derive from helping others succeed. I took delight in the success of others. I once wrote to my lifelong friend Albert Stern and told Stern that my most enchanting memory was watching a friend achieve his lifelong goal. I held contempt for those who achieved successes at the expenses of others or through treachery or underhandedness. I see our culture idolizing success, but the wrong kind of success. I see money as a means to an end. You need to eat, you need it for housing, and a few odds and ends. But I was never interested in becoming wealthy. Wealth to me involved friendships and the ability to do the things you wanted without being restrained. I saw value in accomplishment in reaching and learning new things. And if I had lived long enough, I would have applauded the speech by Martin Luther King. I have a dream that one day man will be judged not by the color of his skin, but by the quality of his character. Try to be a man or woman of character. People who do not value that quality will never succeed in life, no matter how much money they make. I was a leader of men. I lived by example and never let my ego get in the way because I was my own man. I had no fear of others achieving and actually encouraged it. I wasn't afraid they would be more important than me, for I scoffed at my notoriety. I empowered others to work harder and find new ideas, for they allowed me to seek new answers. Those who hold others back or find fault with everything they do feel threatened and insecure. I was never insecure. And I, I would like to say to your viewers, always remember, everything is relative and everything is energy, whether it be positive energy or negative energy. It's all energy nonetheless. It's been a pleasure being with you, Austin, and your audience. I really must get back to my work. I hope that we can get together face-to-face -face and do another one of these broadcasts. Until then, Ladies and gentlemen, goodbye. Have a wonderful year. Stay safe. And that's about it. That's all I have to say at this point. I really need to get back to my work, okay? I thank you so much for this time. I will talk to you soon. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Same to me, Austin. You're a very good man. And what you do at this Flashpoint show, helping people realize how to succeed outside their normal work. You know, probably 90% of people are in a job. It's a job that they were able to get in order to put money in their pockets, food on their table and a roof over their head. But they're really not happy. So if they're working on some kind of sideline gig, like me, when I was working in a patent office, I was constantly, after I finished my work rather quickly, because, you know, it was easy work for me, 
I had plenty of time to study on my side gig. But make sure that you use your imagination. Always use your imagination. When you get stumped in a problem that you're trying to figure out, Make sure that you take time to relax. In my case, relaxing was playing my violin. I love music. Yes. When I was playing my violin, I'd be playing Mozart and listening to it. And the musical notes, because everything is mathematical, including music. And when I would relax like this, or when I like went for walks, I walked everywhere I went. I loved to read. Most of all, I liked to say it was at these times that those aha moments would pop into my head. Not when I was laboring over the problem, but mm. when I gave my mind time to relax. That is when. The problems, the answers to the problems would pop into the head just like a light bulb coming on. I hope your viewers will do the same. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your extra time here. I trust this is going to serve everyone, and we'll see you real soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.